Hey, I'm Mac. Welcome back to my channel. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon for access to new videos 12 to 24 hours early, as well as some Patreon exclusive content. So originally I had a different video planned for uh, this upload, but uh, I got a tip sent in to me. Someone sent in that Kia did a stream about this video that was with the other self-help guru, Kathy Heller, and she's interviewing Rachel Hollis, I guess. I haven't seen it yet, and I didn't want to spoil it, so I haven't watched Kia's video yet, but I'll have it linked. But I didn't want to have a presupposition for my reaction to it. The person also told me that Kia has a hypothesis that this proves that Toilet Gate was kind of a plan all along. So I'm interested to see what we find in that regard. So, uh... Let's go! Oh, by the way, this video is unlisted on YouTube, but um, Kathy Heller links to it just out in the open on her blog. So I'm assuming it's not meant to be like secretive or anything if she's publicly embedding it on her blog. So it's fair game, I think. <laughs> Rachel Hollis. Rachel Hollis, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm like... <laughs> I, I'm so happy that you're here. I think about you all the time that I feel like you're my best friend, but we've never met. <laughs> um, that's called a parasocial relationship. And when you take it too far, it's not healthy. <laughs> Oof. She, she's not your best friend. Do you know that, right? <laughs> what a sweet thing to say. Well, I am so happy to be here. Thank you for um, taking the time. That's really generous um oh by the way i need to add that this was in um february 2021 now remember um toilet gate was april of 2021 so this is pre-toilet gate but post divorce all right because sometimes the timeline gets blurry for me but don't worry we have a video coming up because i'm going to cover um the ticket sales for the tour and as part of that video, I'm going to do like a whole retrospective on it. So be ready for that. Um, no, I feel like, you know, when you, you see someone, you really see them. And I feel like a lot of... You know, when you see someone, you really see them. Yes. People can really see you. And you give so much. You're so unbelievably generous. Con well, she's not exactly like a an apparition here. So yeah, people can see her. What the hell? And no, she's not generous. Instantly pouring yourself out to help this collective to rise. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, God almighty. This is already so painful. I, I don't know how you can possibly want her to pour out of herself, but I would like her to pour herself back into the bottle and pop a cork in it. Do you need me to get a funnel for that? Cause I'll get one. I'll help you. How many hugs could she possibly get today? Because she could use all the. I all the oh, hugs. I miss hugs. I miss <laughs> hugs so desperately. I honestly, when this pandemic is over, people just better get ready because I am gonna be like I'm gonna be tackling people in the streets. I I miss um, those connections so desperately. But I appreciate that you say that. It is. Um, absolutely my intention in life to put goodness and listen um i do not look forward to hugging people that i'm not close with so i guess different experience here positivity out into the world and i am typically talking about or teaching the things that I have struggled with, or maybe even am struggling with in real time. So I always feel like, well, if I need this, there's a chance that maybe she needs this as well. Totally. And now the dog is at the door. So hold on one Go second. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Come on. Come on, buddy. Good boy. Okay, I'm back. 
Um, yeah. And I guess what I want to acknowledge is that once a person is where you're at and they're just like this famous person, it's really easy to not. Okay. Settle down. Not get how much they have overcome to be able to stand in that space. And you're a mom. Wow. And you know what though? It's probably hard for you to imagine how much all people including non-famous people, have had to overcome to be in the spot that they're in. Okay, I almost died. And you have four kids, and you've written about all the things that you've gone through since you were itty-bitty. And it's just like, let's just witness it. Let's just honor it. Let's just take a second for it, because it's a lot. And it's kind of her yeah, kind of Herculean. That you're who you are. Oh, come on. Rachel's been through some shit, but guess what? So have a lot of people. So have a lot of people. Because it's a lot of things. And you're still not only showing up for it, but you like help other people too. Let's just honor that. That's what I mean. Yeah, she just helps people by charging them thousands of dollars for a conference, including marriage advice conferences, and then getting divorced. (laughs) Thank you. Um, I think it is. It is a lot of things. And what I've learned over time, I was actually just talking to somebody about this. Wow. You know, you realize anyone can say that about their life. My life has been a lot of things. Yesterday that... I think when we're younger in our careers or in our journey of of whatever success looks like to us, we tend to believe that it will get easier. Like, oh, if I can just get to this level, if I can just do this thing, or if I can just, and that's actually not true. I, sorry, no, the dog's gonna make all kinds of noise. That's okay, Um, we have lovely editing, so we. Well, it doesn't seem like your lovely editing edited anything there, did they now? So where's your editor? I'm not saying you have to, but if you're going to talk about your editing and then you're going to have it show that you clearly didn't edit, I'm going to be wondering, where's the editing? The lighting has been the exact same this entire video, so I I don't know what you're talking about. Great. Um, I work harder today than I ever have in my entire life. Uh, (laughs) Okay. I mean, that's weird. What did you do? Because I guarantee it wasn't that much. (laughs) I mean, come on. Relax. Um, I don't know. For maybe it's that, maybe it's true of self employment or whatever. But for me, I feel that just as you get more work experience, even if you're not in the same role or same industry or same job, I feel that as you become as you see more workplace situations, I feel like it does get easier with time. I but maybe that's just me because because you've seen a lot of situations before and so it's a little bit smoother when you try to react to them if that makes sense. Or at least it doesn't seem like the end of the world every time anything goes wrong because you've seen it before. And in order to continue to evolve as a creative and as a writer and as a leader and as a woman, it looks like work because evolution is work. And um, so it's not just, I think, for any of us about what did it take to sort of get here? It's also what does it take to maintain that or sustain that momentum so that you can keep growing? Yeah, it's really incredible and i just (laughs) the dramatic irony knowing that this is before toilet gate to just you just have to know how to keep growing and evolving Mm -hmm. okay girl Mm -hmm. girl watch your irony you know there's the whole bunch of people playing the circuit right now so i just want you to know behind the scenes i told my team you know i interviewed matthew mcconaughey and priyanka all the people right and i was like Mm -hmm. i'm not intimidated by them i'm intimidated to interview rachel hollis (laughs) oh my god like please don't i had to have a good cry an hour ago because i had to just like move it up and out with matthew i was like hi hotness but i wasn't 
Oh, with Matthew. Ugh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wouldn't be intimidated by that one either. I need right. to like with you. It's like just fully as a woman, just at a mom, and all the things. Your life, your marriage, your your career. I'm just like God. Can someone stand up for her and keep? <laughs> Um, she has uh, she has stands. I mean, you understand that, right? They stand up for her, and you know what? It's a lot easier to to uh, get to get through things when you have a lot of money. I mean, that's just part and parcel of the territory. I'm not saying it's right, but that's just reality, and. She has had, in my opinion, way more success in her career than she um, deserves for her output. I, I just, I don't think that being a self-help guru and influencer is really hard work. And I don't think that it's something you can say benefits the world. It's more of a flim flam that takes advantage of vulnerable people who are at a point in their life where they feel like they need help moving forward. And you're just taking advantage of them by saying that you, oh, you have, you, you have the thing that you need. I have the thing you need, but Oh, it's going to come in the next class. It's in the next class. It's it's the, the next one is the one that you really need, okay? Like that's going to be everything you need. You you just need to get the next class. Yeah, okay. If you say so. Keep clapping for the next 30 decades. Like it's it's a different kind of a awesome than winning the best beauty pageant. I just I just wanted to say. So, let's get into it for a second because why not? You're here. So, if people haven't read the books, then they're probably living somewhere deep in a cave under a rock. <laughs> but just in case, um, let's... That or they're just not the target audience for it. Besides, not that many people have read Rachel Hollis's books, plural. A lot of people read Girl, Wash Your Face. But after that, uh, the sales were down pretty precipitously. I... I I mean, yeah, a, lo a lot of people read Girl Stop Apologizing, but it wasn't anything. It wasn't anything close to the phenomenon that Girl Wash Your Face was. <laughs> I could see maybe saying heard of the books, but again, you would have to be at least two degrees of separation from the target audience to be familiar with or have heard of Rachel Hollis or these books. If, if you're not anywhere in the orbit of the target audience, you probably have never heard of it. Start with, let's, let's start with what are these big lies, right? When you wrote Girl, Wash Your Face, you wanted to help people stop believing things that they're constantly telling themselves. And that for sure is my audience. So what was the, what was it that made you want to write that book? Well, you know, I want... Uh, what made her want to write that book was a conviction that this would be a really good seller at this perfect time. That that book was sort of you you couldn't have engineered a book that was better suited to capitalizing on the sort of milieu of that specific time. It was the exact right time and it was the exact right presentation and tone um, to, to really catch on with its target audience. So let's, let's get one thing straight there. to talk about some of the hardest 
like the hard fought lessons that I had learned as I was growing up or becoming a woman. Yeah, and you didn't learn any any of those lessons though, because here you are once again making them again, because right? you've got the new Dave now, right? Because oh, just the second person you ever happen to kiss happens to also be your boo thing for life. Okay. Well, I mean, maybe you just have really good luck, but I, guess, I mean, I guess that's possible, but it doesn't seem very likely. When I first set out to write those things down, I didn't realize they were lies. I just started to collect these really hard seasons that I had gone through or things that I had worked through in therapy or whatever. And as I started to write them, I, I began to see a through line. So my best friend, Sammy, always calls that making a connection. She's like, oh, you guys, I just made a connection between this and this. And for me, yeah, everybody uses connection in that way. I mean, there's really, it's really the only word you can use there. I made that connection of like, oh my gosh, all of these hard things that I went through or this tension that I felt always, always came back to a lie that I had believed about my life. And what I would say about that, I mean, Jeffrey, you are going to get put up in another room, brother. I didn't even hear him. Growl. Okay. He was growling. He's trying to start some with an invisible. <laughs> uh, well, and I'm sure that Jeffrey understood that sentence. He's like, oh, oh, the gr I'm sorry. The growling. See, I don't, I don't want to have to go into another room. So I will stop growling, you know? Really? Yeah. Usually with, I, I find that with dogs, usually like one or two word um, commands or things that they're familiar with or that you've rewarded them with before, that that usually works better than trying to get across a whole sentence with tone and stuff. Because while dogs can understand your tone, sometimes people don't understand your tone. So I, I don't know, maybe maybe don't bet all of it on this, this uh, what is it, a schnauzer understanding your tone. Um, but I didn't even know, like uh, the language that I used when I wrote that back in 2017, I said, you know, these are the lies. What I would call that today, as I have learned and understood more, is the paradigms that we are sort of um, born into or raised into or begin to believe. And I think we all have this, men and I mean, it's the same sort of concept. It's just you're phrasing it a different way. And women, but women especially have all sorts of rules and things that we've been told by our family or by culture or society about how we're supposed to show up in the world. And Rachel is the first person to ever realize that. And I think that oftentimes our, our toughest seasons are when like on some level, our spirit is, it knows that this is wrong yeah. for us, knows that this doesn't serve us, knows that we are meant for something greater or more, but you maybe don't even have the language for that, or you kind of don't understand why you feel this way. So um, that, that was where it started and continues uh, to evolve from there. It's so good. And um, I don't know, I'm, I think you probably know this place on site. It's in Nashville. It's oh like yeah, hour. totally. So good. So I went there a year ago and I never, ever thought I was codependent because I'm like hyper independent. Like I never want right. to bother anybody. Da, da. Right. And then I was like, oh, I'm completely codependent because as a girl, I learned how to abandon myself so that everyone's okay right. to such an extent that like I'm setting myself on fire. I can come up with a thousand examples of times I was so uncomfortable and disassociating from whatever I needed because I thought this is how I earn love. This is how my role. Let's talk about that because 88% yes. of our audience is female. And I see that right. consistently. I, I have a female -er audience than, than Kathy Heller. It's, mine's 93%. Um, okay, that's interesting. 
And holy shit, this woman has a lower threshold for crying than Dave Hollis does. And Dave Hollis has like the lowest threshold for crying I've ever seen. So I, for the first time, I'd had some people recommend it. For the first time ever, after I went through my breakup last summer, I read Codependent No More. It's called a divorce when you were married. And it was earth shattering for me. Cause I would say very similarly, I never really understood what it meant to be codependent. I thought that codependent means that someone is dependent on you. And I didn't understand this idea that you sort of are existing to like, you're propping someone else. You're making sure they're okay. You're, and not only that, not only how that manifests in your relationships as an adult, but for me, it was really powerful to understand how I could track that back to my childhood. And how I could understand that, you know, growing up with parents who struggled in the way that my parents struggled would mean that I would walk into a relationships as an adult with that narrative and that belief, like I'm incredibly high capacity and I can fix it and I can solve it. And I do. And um, a lot of times people who say that they can fix things and solve things the way that she just said that only think that they are fixing things and solving things. They they think they are. And the problem is that they really believe that they are fixing things, but really they aren't fixing anything. They're kind of just doing something that they think is right or that they want to do so that the thing isn't relevant anymore or something, or they're putting a little Band-Aid over the problem, or they're adding a new problem so that that distracts from the old problem. That's what I find. I find that very rarely do these people actually, um, who these people who believe that, oh, I can fix everything. Like they don't actually fix anything. They just think that they do. Also, Rachel, why are you wearing a toboggan in your house? Is it cold there? Is it cold in your house? Can you not afford the gas bill? Like what's with what's with the toboggan? Sorry, I mean beanie. We we called them toboggan caps. I don't know. That's the word I learned growing up. Sue me. It's, Cause it's the hat you'd put on if you're riding a toboggan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although sometimes a toboggan has a pom-pom on it. I don't know. Beanie makes me think of something more like a ball cap. I've done that a lot. And I not only did I realize how that manifested in my relationship, but I also was able to see how that manifested in what I do for a living. Like, oh, you had parents who really struggled in these ways. And now you've devoted your life to trying to give people the tools to make change so that they can get better. It's sort of like you couldn't, you couldn't save and fix mom and daddy. So like, could you do that for millions of people? you know, who read your books. Um, but that was wildly powerful for me to understand, again, that, that, that pattern that I had fallen inside of. And if we don't have anything that kind of shakes us loose yeah. of the pattern or makes us rise above it and see what's happening, we'll just continue that for the rest of your life. Oh. Okay. I mean, if, if this whole like analyzing things down to your childhood and going back to your parents and this is why you're a codependent or whatever is helpful for you, then like, that's fine. I'm not trying to take away something that's helpful for you or like a helpful framework for you to think about things. That's fine. But I, f I feel that a lot of times people read into these things so much and they sound so accurate or they sound so so much like they fit that people almost will diagnose themselves as not really diagnosis I don't mean like as as having a disorder or something but they will they will sort of see problems within themselves that weren't ever there and now they believe are there and, and they and they sort of believe themselves to be more broken than they are when I mean when they're not really broken. I hope that that makes sense. It, it's where you you think see I could see um something like this. 
where you say that about yourself and you say like, oh, well, I guess it's just destined to happen because this is how it was with my parents because everybody whose parents didn't get along uh, just believes <laughs> that uh, they need to fix everything, I guess, apparently. I don't know. Um, and I could see how thinking that way about yourself, thinking that, oh, I always need to fix things because this is how my parents were and now I am broken because I always need to fix things. And so anytime I'm trying to solve a problem, that's clearly um, bad. Does, does that make sense? Whereas, yeah, sometimes people solve problems and sometimes that's not a bad thing. So, um, yeah, codependence so is a massive thing. So I feel like so many of those lies, right? And so much of it is like who I need to be for somebody else, right? Or I'm not enough. And if I do this, I will be. And like a lot of that's in the book in other ways. You're saying it, saying the same thing in another way. So how do we begin as women to come back home to ourselves and allow other people to have their side of the street? Like, but feel at least like you took care of yourself, that you lived an authentic day. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I have this like incredible perspective right now because I've just gone through a divorce and I've gone through a divorce. With <laughs> I bet you'll go through some things that'll give you even more perspective, Rachel. Someone that I met when I was 18 years old, I'm 38. Oh so God. I really became, and, and, and if people don't know my story, I, I'm still to this day, never been on a date with anybody except the person <laughs> I married. Like I am so inexperienced and what I have. Uh, that's right. The new boo thing was, was after toilet gate, wasn't it? It was several months after or a couple months after, I think I remember now. Um, yeah. And as you can see, she learned her lesson from her relationship with Dave by immediately following heels over head for literally the first <laughs> the first man she meets after that. So clearly she learned her lesson and, and, and falling heels over head after her first, after her first kiss with the second person she's ever romantically met. Okay. Yeah. You, you really learned. You, you really are so much more careful now, aren't you? Oh, big yikes. Found there's like a beauty. There's such beauty in our story and our relationship and what we were together. And there's also, and I know this is a lot of women's story. There's also something, um, I don't know the word because I, uh, dangerous is, is what's popping in mind, but that's not, that's way too harsh right, for right, what right. I'm saying is like, when you truly become an adult while in relationship with someone else, it really does form your sense of self Words. only in relation to, to someone else. Yep. Now, maybe that would be different if I, like if I had met him when I was 30 and we got together, I would know who I was, I hope. But at 18, going on a first date at 19, like there's no way. Of course. And what I find right now is that, you know, last year was really, it, most of, most of last year was just really hard, really awful like, on the floor. But when I started to kind of come up for air and started to feel like I was healing and I, you know, did 10 million hours of therapy and all of that stuff, what I began to discover was me. And I really was surprised. Cause I mean, if you know my, I am like, I am a strong, I am badass. Oh. Like I know all the things but there were so many parts of myself that I was like, oh, I forgot I loved that. I forgot I hated that. I forgot that I used to want this dream. Well, I'm so glad that you charged women thousands of dollars to learn about themselves when, as I've previously said, you don't have any adult life experience, Rachel, at all. I've said this to you. I've said this about you since November of 2020, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. 
Jesus, God Almighty. Because, and to no fault of his own, this is just sort of how it was, at least in our relationship, codependence, is if he didn't like something, I stopped liking it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, he's not in, like, this is so silly, but I'm going to give you a really good example. I was making tuna salad yesterday and I love dill. I love fresh dill. It's one of my favorite herbs. And I got, uh, I, I got the dill out to add it to the tuna. And immediately I stopped myself because he hates dill, hates the flavor. And I love the flavor and I never used it in cooking. This is so dumb. Because it didn't even occur to me that, oh, you could do that because you like it. Like you didn't have to sort of change yourself for that person. And maybe people listening to this would roll their eyes at that, but you lose yourself in a thousand little ways. Yeah. And it just just made me cry because it's so easy for people to look at someone, especially when they're famous and just have all these opinions, all these opinions. Are we still talking about Dill? And I know, like, my quick one-line story is my mom was suicidal when I was growing up. My dad was alcoholic. They got divorced and, like, been in therapy since I'm 15 and now run this, like, similar mission-driven kind of business to help people find purpose and all this stuff. For sure, I'm doing it for my mother, right, at the end of the Mm day. And I've literally, Rachel, sat. we, We just also left L.A., similar story to you. Oh, and my husband used to work at Fox. So like, okay. and I have three kids. Like, I, I'm it. telling you, like I bawled my eyes out hour ago. I was like, she has no idea. I'm one of a zillion people though, who identifies with you, of course, because you're so generous and vulnerable. But I'm like, Jesus, God almighty. Yeah, she's so generous. She makes money off of this generous work that she does. Do you understand that? She's made millions of dollars in total from it. That's not generous. That is profit. There's a few things. Anyway, (laughs) I've literally sat at the coffee bean on Beverly Drive and someone's talking to me and I see myself getting a parking ticket and I wouldn't interrupt. Right. I grew up. That is a survival skill, right? right? It's like- trauma response and mm-hmm. so i just you know that if you enter you if you interrupt getting a parking ticket you're still you're still getting the parking ticket like that's not going to work because your car is parked there and just because you come out you come running out as you're getting the ticket that doesn't mean that your car wasn't parked there illegally so you're still going to get the parking ticket especially since they're already going to the effort I mean, why? What? Just because you are making the parking enforcement officer's day harder, you think that you shouldn't get a parking ticket? Don't park your car where you're not supposed to. Just feel for, like, it can be beautiful too, but so it it hurts me that people will have opinions and it's like, it's it's just the- It hurts me that people will have opinions. <laughs> it hurts me that people will have opinions. That is truer than she realized. That 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 was probably the best summary of this whole thing. It hurts me that people will have opinions end of sentence. <laughs> I love that. I love it. I love it. I love it. Still, but it's a thousand ways yes. in which you would just say, bye, Rach. Like, right. Yeah. And that's not okay. Right. Well, I, and, and I think that, we, and I'm sure men too, but I think women do this all the time. And it was just a being, having so much time alone. Cause we, we, he has the kids for half a week and I have the kids for right, half a week. Right, right. And so when the kids aren't here, at first, um, cause I, I got my house in like last June. And when I first experienced, you know, co-parenting joint custody, the kids would leave and I would be inconsolable. Course, like I would just be on the floor. Cause I'm like, I've never been, I mean, if I would go on vacation or a business trip, but I had never been away from my kids. 
And so I did not know what, I didn't know what to do with myself. And I wallowed in that for, for several weeks. And then I was finally like, you know what? How many freaking moms wish they could have a Sunday to themselves? Oh my God, please. Like, yeah. Right? Like if this is your, re- <laughs> this is your reality. So you right. can sit here and cry about this, or you can be grateful for the goodness that's in it. And in that, like getting okay with the fact that I would have time by myself, I've met myself again. Yeah. And I just, I can't tell you how many things I, I remembered. So what you started out by asking is like, how do people, you know, come yeah. back to the sense of yeah. self? And yeah. I think it's like really getting back in touch with who were you before you were theirs? Who were you before you were that person's partner? Who were you before you were their mama or even their friend? Like, who were you? Because she is still there. And, and the, who we were when we were younger is so formative in how we show up today. Yeah. And just kind of relearning those things that you used to love and that you love because you're into it. And it doesn't matter if anybody else gets it. So that that's a big way. And I'll just say tactically, because I love tactics. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of journaling. I do a lot of journaling. And I know there's a bunch of different ways to kind of learn yourself. And maybe I love that method because I'm a writer, but that really helps me get my thoughts sort of poured out on paper and I can kind of separate myself from them. Um, so I do a lot of journaling. If, if anybody listening has never read the artist's way, which is like 25 years so old. Good. Yeah. Um, but there's this practice of doing journaling every single morning, um, really simple stuff in that book. But I highly recommend that of, of just, for me, journaling forces me to slow down mm-hmm. and be aware Mm-hmm. And we can't really know ourselves if we're not aware of what do you love? What do you hate? What are you right. interested in doing? Right. Um, so that that's what it looked like for me. So good. Yeah. We had Julia Cameron on the show. And oh, she, love she's her. so cute. Yeah. And I just also wanted to say, as we sort of close out this piece of the conversation is that I remember in early two thousands when Al Gore and Tipper Gore got divorced and I was like, I don't know, 21 or something, but I remember this letter she wrote to the New York times. And she said, we've been married all these years. If you would have been at a job for two, three, four decades and made beautiful children, right? right? Like if you would have done some people be like, that was amazing. We're going to throw you a party. She's like, um, if I were at a job, and as a result of that job, I made children. Uh, I would be talking with HR, probably. I'm just saying. Because uh, there's no way I consented to that. Instead, people are like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. This failed. That's a disaster. That She's like, Al and I made the most beautiful 40 years of our life, have the most incredible kids. And now we can be like not that, but something else. And you would think that people could honor, right? Like that is a success. Right. It's amazing. Like, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I definitely do. Well, I guess it's that whole, like till death do us part thing. I'm not, I, I don't, I, that's your, a lot of people are always going to see that as a failure. Okay. Because generally Success in a marriage is not considered to be divorce, okay? But I I understand this way of looking at it, but the way that you're phrasing it makes it sound like toxic positivity. And it makes it sound like you are in denial. We understand that there were parts of it that worked, but people are just talking about specifically the divorce. So when you say that the divorce is a success, that's weird. They're not saying necessarily that the marriage was a failure, although some people will say that. But usually if it's people discussing it around the time of the divorce, that's what they're talking about. And they're talking about the, the divorce itself and also the likely very tense, very um, loveless, very argumentative phases or years possibly that led up to that point. That's that's what people are talking about. That's the failure right there. It's, it's when you guys started not working together, you know, when you started not being able to get along. That's failure. That's not success. 
any way you slice it. Because I, something caused you. You didn't just get divorced because you were like, you know, let's do something crazy. Okay, no, there were things that led up to getting that divorce. That's the failure. And that's fine. It's okay to fail at things sometimes. And it doesn't mean that it's a total failure. But don't act like it's a total success. No one gets married going, I hope we get divorced. I, think, I never realized, because I used to do this too, that we really give credit to relationships based on length. Not on quality. It's so dumb. It's so. D- <laughs> yeah, girl, you got to think about the quality. Also, um, the girth is important, probably. Dumb. And we all right now know people who have been together forever and their relationships miserable. And yet we would celebrate like, oh, 30 years of marriage or whatever. I I believe my, my marriage was an incredible success. Yeah. We have made beautiful things. We helped each other to grow. Yeah, but didn't you tell us that for like the past three years, you've had serious problems where you're just arguing all the time and shit and not getting along? See, that that's not a success when you are arguing or fighting with a person for three years. Oh, we have these four awesome kids. Oh my gosh. And so what everybody else perceives of that whatever a hundred percent yeah it doesn't it doesn't matter and i i guess i would speak to anybody who's going through not just a divorce but also a relationship of any kind i think that it's meant to be what it was i really do live my my life believing that things happen as they're meant to and so i don't hold very tightly to what i well i believe that things happen the end. I think things are supposed to be because I think that that, that just creates unnecessary pain. So yeah. it was exactly what it was meant to be. Beautiful. Agreed. I'm so happy that we at least got to say that on this show. And I'm sure you've <laughs> said it a million other times. Um, so I would just like to reiterate the reason people were upset about the divorce is because you and Dave charged couples thousands of dollars for marriage advice and then you admitted that while you were selling those conferences you were on a path toward divorce and you admitted it you you said that it was three years of ongoing problems that were that were heading for a divorce And that was the period during which you were charging people thousands of dollars for marriage advice conferences. And when those people wanted their marriage to be a success, they didn't mean success by your definition, which apparently means divorce is a success. Okay, that's not what they meant. That's not that's not what they wanted. I'm just saying that's why people were upset. So don't get that twisted, even though you're going to. I know you're going to. You're going to say that that's why you have so many haters. That's you don't have so many haters just because you got divorced. That's not the that is not the reason that you have haters. on to of course it's so hard to talk about three of your books in this short time but one piece I think we could talk about from Girl Stop Apologizing which I think it's at the root of everything poisonous is shame I think Mm -hmm. shame is like ugh, like regret is so healthy oh I want to be constructive and fix but shame and so in this book you literally say it's a shame-free plan for embracing and achieving your goals but what does that mean to you where does shame show up do you think for women and i wouldn't say that shame is necessarily the counterpart to regret i would say that there's guilt and then there's shame like guilt is a more productive emotion. It it usually is something where you've done something wrong and you are going to try not to do it again. Whereas shame is more of just a, a very punitive thing. But maybe that's just me. How is that dangerous? And how can we 
welcome all parts of ourself so that this 20 town brick is not carrying on our back. I'm probably going to misquote it, but Brene Brown has this quote that I love that says something like, frankly, I'm just impressed that you gave the source. Guilt is the feeling that you did something wrong and shame is the feeling that you are wrong. Mm. Like that there's, I don't know. Maybe I absorbed that from her. I've never read any of her work though. So I don't know. Something wrong with you. Wow. And that always resonated with me so much because I feel like most women, when they don't meet whatever, you know, invisible standard they've, you know, the world or themselves have set for themselves, they feel like there's something wrong with them. They're not like, oh, I didn't do that. They're like, oh, I knew it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not young enough, old enough, thin enough, whatever it is. And so we allow that feeling to control what comes next. I think shame is something that is used by, a, for a lot of us, by parents, by our family of origin, maybe by partners in the past to control us. And then we allow that shame that we manifest ourselves to control our actions too. And the reason I wanted to call it shame free was because so many women, like I tend to attract women who have big dreams, who are ambitious, who are extra, who have bright lights Mm -hmm. to shine. And they struggle with what other people think of them for that. What does their mother-in-law think or their partner or kids or friends or whoever. And so they stop themselves from trying or putting themselves out there for fear of what's going to happen if they do. Um, And yet you couldn't use dill in a recipe, even if you were the only one who was going to eat it until you got divorced from Dave, because Dave did not like dill. Really? So you're going to show these women how to stop letting other people's opinions uh, impinge upon them being themselves, even though you it, even though you divorced from the person who didn't like dill, still had difficulty using it in a recipe, even though you love it. Really? Really? Seems like maybe someone who came to that realization earlier would be a better guide for those women on how to not let um, other people stop them from going for a goal that they have every right to have. I I don't know. I I just, I can't imagine if you couldn't use dill in a recipe, what else would you not do? Because that seems pretty trivial to me. That seems like something where it's like, okay, well, you know, this dish is just for me. So you don't have to worry about the dill in it, Dave. Or just get over it and you make something then. Because I'm writing books now. Okay, it sounds like a lot of fucking work. What do you do, Dave? Nothing. Um, and it is a it is not a, a light switch, at least for me. I wish that it's something that we could just kind of flip off and then those feelings never pop up again or that negative self-talk never shows up in your life. But what I found is it really is a process of learning yourself, learning your triggers, like what's going to set you off um, and learning how to navigate around them. Um, I actually made a big decision yesterday. I haven't told my team yet and I haven't announced this publicly, but I made a big decision yesterday that I am going to shut off all comments on all my social media platforms forever. That's a terrible idea. That's how I can tell that I can tell that you haven't told your team that yet, because that's a terrible idea. Because let me tell you something. If people have something that they want to say about you, they're going to find a way to say it. And you're better off just letting them say it wherever it's the easiest so that they don't have time to go, you know, crafting their thoughts about it and stewing about it. If people have something to say, they're going to find a way to say it to you. They they just are. That's just the way it is. And second of all, it's just, it, that's a terrible social media strategy because people don't want to participate in a, a social media 
following thing. They they don't want to follow someone where they're not even able to comment if they want to. It, that's part of the whole, you know, engagement thing. People like to have a discussion. Like you're 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 people just aren't going to aren't they're not going to feel like following someone who doesn't even allow them to comment. Um, And I made that decision because I have spent so much time working on not caring what other people think and not hearing that negative voice. And I've done so much work on this. Like, I don't know if anybody has worked as hard on this topic as I have. But I've noticed this shift in the last year. Okay, Rachel. So Rachel has worked the hardest on not caring what people think. Okay. Here, especially, I don't know if it's because people are at home or they have more time. There's so much vitriol in the comment section. And maybe it's because you and Dave charged people thousands of dollars for marriage advice conferences, like less than a year before this. And then got divorced three months later. I I think that's that would cause some people to be extremely angry. Truthfully, what I have done for the last year is like when I happen to see something and like, look, if I say something stupid or ignorant, it is. Yes. Be like, girl, we don't say that. That is you don't whatever. And I'm like, oh, my God. You say that, but you don't act that you talk the talk there about accepting criticism but you don't walk the walk because you don't see any um comment correcting something ignorant that you said you don't you don't see it that way you don't see it as um being constructively corrected even though it is i think that you sort of don't understand that sometimes constructive criticism, sometimes constructive criticism can hurt, but that doesn't mean that it's not constructive. Sometimes no matter how constructively someone puts something and no matter how much you needed to hear that constructive criticism, it still hurts because it's criticism (laughs) of something that you probably worked really hard on. So, and, and you kind of just, for someone who talks so much about sitting in the hurt or whatever, it, yeah, it, it it's going to hurt, but you have to understand that if it truly is purely contract for criticism and it's stuff that you needed to hear, the person probably didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but that doesn't change the fact that it, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt your feelings either way. Otherwise, it's probably just some bullshit rah 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 yes man shit and then you're never gonna you're then you're never gonna grow because you won't think that you need to i'm just saying i i feel like a lot of people think that feedback or criticism that is good criticism and constructive they think that that means that it that if it hurts then it's not constructive and that's not true. <laughs> Constructive criticism hurts as well. And and that's okay. That's just how it is when someone criticizes something that you worked on. <laughs> that's fine. You you take the hurt and you 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 know, thank them for the feedback and try to incorporate and try to incorporate with it. But in that immediate, you know, in that immediate um in the immediate aftermath of it, you're like you're going to immediately feel hurt by it. But once you know um, to expect that and to realize that this will pass and I will be able to see the value in this criticism and this will make what I'm doing going forward better, you can kind of get past that and stop focusing on the fact that it hurt your feelings. And it's okay to acknowledge that it hurt your feelings as well. You don't have to just say that, oh, I don't care what anyone thinks. You don't have to say that. 
you can you can say, oh, I appreciate your, your feedback, but it still hurts. <laughs> it's okay. I, like, you, I understand. Or even just, oh, you know, thanks for the feedback. Mm. It, pe- people understand when they're giving you constructive criticism that it's going to hurt your feelings. You know, you kind of, but you kind of have to just um, trust that they're going to see that you're not trying to hurt them. And and of course, there are some people online who are trying to be hateful and hurt your feelings, and they don't care if there's any value in what they're saying or if what they're saying is true. And they're they're just trying to be mean and they're trying to hurt your feelings. But the problem with you, Rachel, is that you see those two things as one and the same, yet you talk the talk of of wanting constructive feedback, of wanting people to say that, to tell you when you've said something ignorant. But but yet that's not the way that you actually, um, that's not the way that you actually behave. And it's not the way that you will behave in a couple of months after this. Big yikes, big yikes. It's like watching Oedipus Rex. <laughs> thank you so much. I've, I've learned, thank you for that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking I about know. me posting a picture of like a tree uh, and some be, someone being like, you're ugly, go die. Like the, you would not believe the comments, like the things people say. And what I've gone to do. I don't think that anybody other than the people who write that shit is is saying that that's defensible. But if you are going to let those people determine whether you allow anybody to comment is stupid. And you're kind of punishing people who might have just thoughts they want to share or even compliments they want to give you, you're punishing them for the fact that some people are trolls. And that's just the way it is. You know, you can do all kinds of things to moderate and to get rid of those things. Two is I will go look at people I admire. I'll go look at The Rock or you know, Lizzo or Reese Witherspoon or just different people. And I'll scroll until I find people saying hateful things to them. And I'm like, oh, see, look, this is the price of admission. This is how the internet works. It is what it is. And I had this like epiphany yesterday. I thought if my kid was being bullied, I would not tell them to go find another kid getting bullied to know that that was normal and okay. No freak. So the difference is that um, a child is different from an adult celebrity. And I don't mean adult celebrity like a porn star, but I would hope those aren't the same thing. But I mean that one of these things is a child and the other thing is an adult. And we don't expect, um, well, and I don't expect adults to be able to cope with being bullied, but you, it's it's certainly going to be less traumatic um, generally. I mean, it could still be traumatic, but it's going to be less traumatic than it would be as a child during your formative years. It's just not the same thing. No one says that like, <laughs> You should have to be bullied as a child. Well, I guess some people probably do, but those people are kind of awful people. It's those are those are just not the same thing. I I don't know how else to explain that. Anyway, and it really is like social media has become this thing where it's like you're coming into my yard, you're coming into my house and being like, "I this is ugly. I hate this house. I would never." <laughs> You invited the internet in. I would think that if I'm inviting, you know, let's go with the metaphor. If I'm inviting everybody, there's a reason that I don't invite everybody into my house. Um, like, But like if you're invite, you invited everyone to come in, you said, hey, everybody, I have so much great advice. I have so much great marriage advice. Um, I, I have all the answers for you. Everybody, everybody come look. 
That's that's effectively what you are doing, right? It is. It's very different from being someone who never invited people to come in. You invited everybody over. And so, of course, not everybody is going to like the way that you've decorated. I I, I don't know. The, the metaphor doesn't, it, it's, it's not helping you. It's crazy. And as a creator, it does begin to affect what you put out in the 100%. world. 100%. You know, you control your message. You don't say the same things. Like I have found myself... I'll just like put an emoji, like a literally, I'll have a picture and I'll just put like. So see, this is what tells me that you treat hateful comments like go die the same as you treat um, feedback that you can use comments. Because how, how would someone saying go die how like how would how would you adapt your content in response to that i mean i mean there's really other than just not posting anymore there's really not any way to incorporate that feedback into your into your post content so if it contained information that you were able to incorporate and and change the way that you um that you delivered your content that suggests to me that it was it must have been constructive otherwise how could you how could you use it in shaping your messaging i mean that's how feedback works it's that that's i'm sorry if you if you think that you should never have to um if if you don't want to change the way that you say things then you don't have to no one's forcing you to do that it's just you are incorporating what they're saying into your messaging. And I and I guess you don't, you think that you shouldn't have to and that everyone should have to like you. I don't understand. People are allowed to have opinions. Not everyone has to like you. And you, I, it's so frustrating. Like a heart emoji. I will say nothing. And I found myself doing that. I am a fuck, sorry, I don't know if I can cuss on your show. I'm a fucking writer and I'm not writing because I know that someone's going to find something in that to hate on. And then other people will try and come to my defense and then it becomes, it's crazy. And oh, but I thought no one ever stood up to you, stood up for you, Rachel. So what's with the people coming to your defense? I thought that nobody ever stands up for you. Didn't, didn't one of you said that no one ever stands up for Rachel. So who are these people coming to her defense, huh? Furthermore, that's what that's see what if what they're saying about your writing, if they're if they're specifically picking out something in what you wrote and they're saying something about it. It, it you just said that you want to be told when you've said something ignorant. To me, this example Sounds like someone saying that something you wrote was ignorant. So this here seems like you talking the talk, but you're not walking the walk because you realize that walking the walk still hurts. And you're not okay with that. Because you just you just don't want to ever be disagreed with or criticized under any circumstances for any reason. That's what's going on here. And I, I know that there are people who don't have comments on, like Taylor Swift doesn't have comments yep. on anything she yep. does. Okay, well, Taylor Swift was already a commercially successful musician before social media became the thing that it is. And, and so she found her success without too much help from social media. And furthermore, just the fact that she is a commercially extremely successful musician means that she's not depending on um, social media engagement necessarily as a core part of her um, strategy. Okay, so she doesn't like she doesn't really need the comments section. Like she's she is a huge A list musician, so. 
that's very different from you, Rachel, where you're you are a an, you're a self help author and a social media influencer, pretty much. So I'm sorry. Part of that is you have to have your you you got your start um, with that bikini photo. So your start was an Instagram post. So given that social media is a core part of your business value proposition, yeah, you and Taylor Swift have different, um, you have different practices on social media that would be acceptable and to your benefit. I'm, I'm sorry that the strategy that is fine for Taylor Swift is not fine for you, but you, you're, you're number one, you're not a musician like Taylor Swift, and number two, you're not a list like Taylor Swift. Okay, Taylor, Taylor Swift didn't get famous from an Instagram post. And I feel like I've hesitated to do it because I, I'm like, no, you're strong enough. Like you got this, you can take this. And I just had this like thing yesterday where I thought, no, yeah. no, you don't get, if you want to hate me, awesome. You don't get to do that in my space. Yep. So this is sort of the boundary. This is kind of going back to that idea of codependence is if you're, ra- if you were raised in a certain way, if you were raised to be a good girl, if you were raised to be pleasing to others, if you were raised to make sure that you got good grades and the teachers liked you and mom and daddy were proud, this ends up manifesting in how we show up in other places. And we believe that on some level, you deserve to get to say those things about me. Oh, did I not show up in the right way? Oh my did my God. hair not look good? Did my, was my outfit not right? You know, I saw, um, I, I, some, I, just, and I don't normally review comments. But the other day I was, I was in there because I just wanted to write back. People were saying really sweet things. My son had done an episode of a show with me. He's so so cute and he was so proud of himself. So I was going in to just like say thank you because people were being so sweet. And someone was just like, literally, who do you think you are? Like, what are you even doing? You're trying to do, now you have a show and then you're this, and then now you're a writer and you're going to, and it was, and then other women were like, finally, someone said it. Who does she think she, and I was like, I, you know, blocked. Cause I'm just like, get out of here. But at the same time, I thought, man, if I create content that you don't like, unfollow me. That's- oh my God. Wait, where did it, the tone was the same as, oh, holy fuck. Why do you follow me if you don't already have my book? Man, I can't, I can't sing anything without getting like that <laughs> pop punk inflection. I've, I've tried for like years to undo that, but I can't, but I can't. Just goes right out my nose. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, well, you know, people are allowed to have opinions and people are allowed to express those opinions and it seems like those women were having a discussion. And if you don't like that, then block them. You can do that if you want to. You can block people if they're being if they're being rude and hateful. Absolutely. I block people all the time if they say like shit about my sexual orientation or whatever. I'm just like, okay, block. Like, I don't have to read this shit. Like (laughs) there's no, there's nothing wrong with, with blocking people who are, who are being hateful. Honestly though, like, I I, I don't know. It, It really seems like any, any criticism is, is just totally unacceptable to you. And I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I'm not saying that you have to read things like that. Although I would say the exchange that you are describing to me, it sounds like if you were in a place where you could handle it, which, and I'm not saying that you have to be, but if you were there, there might've been some useful stuff in there for shaping your strategy going forward. I'm just saying they 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 might have in there said some things that would let you in on 
like what's upsetting people. And I'm not saying that you have to read it. I know that sometimes what people say is just purely hurtful or whatever. But there might have been some useful stuff in there. But you'll never know, I guess. But the fact that you would follow me just to say hateful things, I'm I'm continuing this paradigm. So true. That you get an opinion here. It's and that so you true. can shame me into silence or that you can shame me into not posting. And so I feel like honestly, I'm gonna sound I'm gonna pull a soapbox, but I feel like as <laughs> I don't think that those people care whether you post or not. I think that they just don't want other people to have the wool pulled over their eyes. Or maybe they just want to, um, maybe they want to have a discussion with other people who think the same way that they think. Because, I don't know, maybe they haven't found somewhere else where they could do that. But what I am going to say is, it. It's not going to stop people from saying things about you if they want to. It's 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 going to make people more determined to to fucking say what they want to say. And, and people have the right to an opinion, even if it's not a constructive opinion. I'm not saying they have a right to be hurtful. You can block those people. But people have the right to an opinion. As a society, we have got to start saying this is not okay. It's not okay. It, it's not okay. It no. is It is so awful. What, you, you gonna make it illegal to have an opinion about a celebrity? Like I love Lizzo, she's one of my favorites. Yeah. And she put- You are not Lizzo. I said this thing the other day that w she was clearly trying to make people smile. She was like getting ready to go to the gym and she was like putting a wig on, it was so funny. And she's clearly trying to do something, put it out in the world to make people and I can't even believe the stuff people wrote. And this wasn't like you had to scroll down. This was just one after another, after another about her body, about what she needed to look like, about- I'm, She probably doesn't read that shit though. Be, like, number one, she's she's she probably has so many followers that, how would you even read that many comments? Because there's probably so many just because she has, she has such a large following because she's an A-list celebrity. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. You can't stop people from doing it. And she, when you, if someone who's at that level is probably not reading the Instagram comments, at least not like that. And it's also possible that they have stuff filtered out too. So that if it's something hateful or rude or whatever, they don't even see it. Girl, it's not okay it's and we accept okay. it we accept it and say that this is what social is and i just um no yeah so. no it's so cruel and my husband always says like when i get like a nasty comment or someone has to go and leave a one-star review on the podcast he's like their tax dollars don't go to you right. what do they care that's like, what you that's owe them nothing they're letting other people who might be interested in your podcast know that they thought that your podcast was not good. It, it like it's. It, do you understand that you don't have the right to have a five star rating on the podcast app? Because guess what? The purpose of that rating is so that other people who are looking for a new podcast to listen to can quickly look at the star rating and think, oh, wow, 4.9 or 4.8 or whatever. I, I'm going to check out an episode of this and see what I think, because it sounds like it's pretty good. Or maybe they're like, oh, three out of five stars. This is not very good. And guess what? The people who left those one star reviews and brought that rating down to three out of five saved those people a lot of time that would have been wasted listening to your to that podcast. I don't know what the rating of your podcast is, but what I'm saying is 
you don't have the right to a five star rating and that rating isn't for you it's for it's for other people who are looking for a new podcast i i do you not look at the star rating when you go to look for something to listen to i i, I don't understand so everyone's just supposed to if you don't like a podcast you shouldn't rate it then how is anyone supposed to know if a podcast is good or bad? Do they have to listen to every single podcast? That doesn't make any sense. That's not how ratings work. Not everyone has to say something positive about you. If they don't like something, they don't have to, they don't, you don't have any right to not be, to not, to not be negatively reviewed. If I don't like something, I can say that and, and rate it. That's what I'm supposed to do when I, when something is supposed to be rated or reviewed and I try it and I don't like it. It's, it's not, it's not asking for me to give constructive feedback or anything that it's let it's for me to let other people who are considering this thing. know I didn't like it for me. It was a one out of five stars. I hated it. That, that's what I'm supposed to leave. That's, that's what you're supposed to do in a rating is give your opinion. People understand when they read a review that it's someone's opinion. Jesus, God almighty. What a stupid thing to say. Uh, so now no one can rate your podcast if it's not five out of five? Jesus. Imagine not liking something and leaving a negative review. They can just like click off of it. She's an yes. idiot. Unsubscribe. But instead it's like, no, I will take my precious time to make sure she knows. She says right. like too much. She's actually right. too happy. I don't like her. Fr They're not. Maybe they, maybe they are, but the purpose of giving them that, that form is not for you. It's for people who perhaps might hate when people say like too much. They can look at the reviews for your podcast and they can go, oh, this review says that she says like all the time. Oh, that drives me crazy. I'm going to, I'm just not, I'm going to go listen to a different podcast because this one's going to, this one's going to get on my nerves. I hate that too. It's to save them time so that they know which things they will like and which they might not like by by showing them what other people liked and didn't like and why. It, 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 they don't have to be constructive. It can be like, I don't like when she says like all the time. That way people who don't like that can see that review and know that about your podcast. I, <laughs> wow. It's such a stupid take. Sorry if that was hurtful of me to say. She needs to get her teeth done. And I'm like, right. oh, that's just me. Right. Like, and right. because you and I are actually really vulnerable, I care. I, I, I'm an empath. Like, it, I feel things. So right. how could I not feel that? Oh, see, I don't feel things. Right. Absolutely. Well, and it's like we that I might, I just hit a point where I was like, you know what? I've done all the work oh on me that I need to do. I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I'm starting, I'm starting to see what I'm, I'm starting to see what Kia is saying. <laughs> oh boy, boy, boy. The, this is the most dramatic irony ever. She's done all the work she needs to do on herself. Okay, well, um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out.
tell you how many times I have prayed. I with a therapist, just like, what am I meant to learn? Why am I getting this? Why am, why did I see that comment? Like, what was I supposed to learn from this? Uh, and I'm like, maybe what I'm supposed to learn is to stick up for myself. Yeah. Because, boundaries. because the, the truth is, as someone with a platform, and if you're listening to this right now, I'm not just talking about the platform I have. I think that someone who has 500 followers on social media probably gets this. Or maybe you're just posting on your personal Facebook right. page and your Aunt Mildred saying something crazy to you. Like we all have our version of this and it is not our job to accept that. Mm-hmm. You can think whatever you want, you can write whatever you want, but you're not gonna do it in my space because as a person with a platform, I can't defend myself. I can't go in and clap back at you because I'm going to start a war. Oh, no, no, no. And so it's like, I just have to take this. No. No. So I don't know what the answer is, but it's definitely not what's happening right now. Well, I love that you're going to. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. Kia's right. Holy shit. Oh, oh, wow, 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 wow. She totally thought when the, when the, when the you're unrelatable comment happened, she's like, right there, that's my opportunity to finally clap back and stand up for myself. And I'm, and it's going to start a whole movement and everyone's going to be like, rah, rah, you know, Finally, someone's standing up for the celebrities. Finally, you know, someone's making sure that you guys are okay. Standing up for you. Some Finally, someone's fighting the good fight. Okay. And she was just going to, you know, lead this march down the streets with just all the townsfolk cheering and going, yeah, stand up for the celebrities. You, all they are is just, you know, filthy rich and adored by a ton of people. You know, poor things. You poor, poor things. Mm, someone says something mean about you on the internet. Uh, oh, that's, oh, she really thought she was doing something with that Toilet Gate TikTok. Oh, she really, really, really thought she, that explains so much about why she left those posts up for so long, because she really, really, really thought she was doing something. She really thought she was going to fucking start a movement, didn't she? Wow. Yeah, Kia's absolute. Oh, I. this has to be what she's talking about. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, there's just, there's no other way. There, it, it has to be that she really thought she was going to start a movement with that TikTok. This was, that was, that was her goal this whole time. That was just the culmination. This was that, the moment that she was going to finally say that she's had enough because someone said that you are privileged AF and you're unrelatable, <clears throat> which, I would I would actually say is constructive criticism in your line of work, Rachel. That's something that you could have incorporated going forward into your um, uh, uh, live streams and the content that you discussed and the way that you discussed it. But I guess that's not the way that you saw it. You saw it as such a vicious attack for someone to say that you're unrelatable, which honestly is not. It's, I don't know. It's not really mean to say that. <clears throat> I don't, I wouldn't say that that's bullying to say that you're unrelatable or you're privileged AF. That's not bullying. I, I don't know. I, the fact that you could read that as bullying is insane to me and speaks to you having, having have just, tissue paper thin skin just wafer thin oh I can't she really thought she was gonna do she really thought she had done something didn't she
going to hopefully start like a beautiful trend for so many of us. I think I, that's. I... <sighs> <laughs> knowing the outcome this is so <laughs> oh this is great when you know what actually happened two months later <laughs> really refreshing because I feel sometimes that the creator is being taken hostage because you can't yeah. say anything you're just like nothing oh you know and truthfully, and Rachel, you know this, I just spent a week, sorry, I just spent a week with Joe Dispenza. And oh, I love him. Beyond, like ridiculous. And everything is a freaking hologram. So right. all of that negativity, that's their projection. Like, right. and, and yes, it's so damn easy to be threatened by you because going back to the shame, you've allowed yourself to show up when you're sweaty, in your van, crying, right. snotting, talking right. about all the things, your period, your kids, whatever. Right. That is literally that's literally curated imperfection. That's that's all that is. That's her choosing those moments very carefully. Notice that none of the things that she showed were that were the three years of arguments with Dave, you know, because that's a real problem. That's a real problem that's actually ugly. Unlike being snotty in your car. Really? really it has a lot of the same color schemes as being vulnerable but it's not it, it's just not and and it's very carefully selected shit so no i mean it's just ridiculous i mean get, get over it the brightest shining light that break, broke through any cloud and do you know how much that hurts a person who does not want to let go of their shame? It's like, oh, that makes me know that I actually could and I can't. Right. How dare right. she? How dare right. she just allow herself to be who right. she is with all the brokenness? Right. My best friend talks about this a lot. My best friend was a pastor of a mega church and um, came out. And wrote an incredible book called Worth It, which everyone should go grab. Um, <laughs> and she talks about this idea that when you experience freedom, when you have this freedom to be yourself, some people see that as a light and, and an example that they also can shine. And some people do feel threatened because even if they're not aware of it, subconsciously, it reminds them that they're still stuck. How dare you compare the valid criticism you get online to the struggle of coming out and the freedom that you feel after you do? How fucking <laughs> dare you? That pisses me off so much that that's where I'm going to and my response to to that comment. I, I'm not even going to go into it. You know what? I'm not even going to go into it on that because that pisses me off so much. How fucking dare you? Don't you ever talk about coming out and how it is at all similar to anything you've ever gone through, Rachel. Don't you ever in fact, let me let me word it in your preferred format. Ready? Girl, that's ignorant what you said. Or they're still in chains or they're still not free. And so what they do is I have to break this down or show you how you're wrong or make you feel mm -hmm. bad. And I don't even think it's a conscious thing, to be honest. I just think that this is normal. And truthfully, I think it's just as hurtful for the person who's writing it. Like, man, if I can't have social media without you, Karen, feeling the need to be me, <laughs> then great. Yeah. I'm going to take, I'm going to take this away because also this isn't a good thing for your heart.
Like you are creating this reality that people are mean and awful and out to get you and lying yeah. and whatever. You, it's like, it, it's just crazy. Yeah, it is. And that's really, really. Number one, she, clearly she thinks that anything she's ever gone through, it, I, I'm so done talking about the coming out thing. You get it. You get it. I, I, I don't want my blood pressure going up any higher. <laughs> Um, but also here, is she really trying to spin her disabling comments as being like altruistic? Rachel, the fact that you are letting these comments just marinate in your brain is at some point your responsibility. Uh, you know, there oh, I'm trying to remember there was there's a wise woman from whom I heard this these these words of wisdom, Rachel. Uh and they are if you're unhappy, that's on you. And I, I think that's true here, Rachel. I, I just, I can't remember. Where did I hear that from? Where did I hear that from? Who knows? Who knows? Um, so then you went ahead and did it again. It's it's like already the coolest, hardest thing in the world to write a New York Times bestselling book. And then you're like, I'll just do it three times because why not? I've already done it once, whatever. So then you write a Wasn't her third book... Uh... What was her third book? Was it Didn't See That Coming? Because I don't think, was that a New York Times bestseller? I didn't think it was. Maybe it was. I don't know. I thought I didn't make the list. Doesn't she only have two? I'll check later and then I'll edit this out. Book in the middle of a pandemic, you come up with another book. Um, so Didn't See That Coming, like the perfect title. I'm sure by now everyone's like, we read it, we heard it. I'm like, all right, well, this is when she was on the show. So we're going to talk about it again. So let's talk about why, why you felt the need to write. Uh, clearly something was so on your heart to write this in the middle of everything that was going on. <laughs> what do I say about something being on someone's heart? What do I say? Nothing good ever comes from someone saying that something has been on their heart. There's nothing good that ever follows it. And so I think that I think I think we've got the relevant portion of this video in. And I'm so glad. Um, so glad that I was made aware of this. Uh, thank you, Kia, for discovering it. And thank you, Anonymous, who sent me that uh, tip off. And uh, I'm gonna have to go check out Kia's video now because uh, I'm curious to see the rest of her thoughts on it. All right, everybody. I've been Mac. Peace out. Bye!